Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning and welcome to our introductory keynote for Freelance Business Month. Uh, we are incredibly grateful to be here. Thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, but who are we? Well, uh, I'm Alex. And I'm Lizzie. And we are the co-authors of the book Work Style. Uh, we're also the co-founders of Hoxby. Uh, but we'll come on to all of that in good time. We're going to tell you what Work Style is, who Hoxby is. Uh, but more importantly, we're going to be talking about um, the way we work, the role of freelancers in the future of work, what we think the future work of work might be, uh, and in particular, how we think uh, diversity and diverse communities will come to play their role uh, in shaping the future of work. Absolutely uh, central is what we think, but we'll come on to that in more detail. <laughs> we will, we will. Um, uh, but before we get into that, uh, we thought we'd just take a couple of minutes to just introduce ourselves and our backgrounds that have kind of taken us to this point. Uh, Lizzie, do you want to kick us off? Yes, yes. So um, as you may have gathered from the blatant t-shirts, we're here to talk about work style. Everything we do is about work style. And when we talk about where the future will take us in work context, we believe work style is the future of work. Um, and just to give some context to our stories, um, we'll just define what we mean by work style. Work style is a word that we invented. Alex and I came up with it in the pub, where all the best ideas happen in the UK, about eight years ago. And we came up with it as a word to describe the freedom to choose when and where you work. As a freelance group, you'll already understand that. For many employees, they find it harder to grasp that concept. Um, but we believe that with various changes that are happening, everyone should now be free to work in their own work style. And we're going to tell you why um, over the next half an hour. But as Alex says, first, we're going to tell you why this is so important to us um, personally. So for me, this started when I had my first child. I now have three, uh, which is quite overwhelming. Um, but when I had my first child, um, I'm embarrassed to say that my eyes were really opened to the pervasive inequalities in work. Uh, until then, I'd been pretty much equal with my husband in terms of how we'd worked. Um, our career trajectories had been about the same. Um, and when I had my son, I realized that the nine to five, five day a week working structure that has survived for the last 200 years since it was invented by the great Sir Robert Owen um, just didn't work for me anymore. Uh, because actually I wanted to be with my child when he was awake and I wasn't going out in the evenings. So I wanted to be able to work then. And then actually I should be able to be judged on my output rather than when I was in a particular place. So Alex and I came up with the concept of work style, but since we came up with that and we built the business Hoxby around it, I've had more cause to really come to value work style in my life. Um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer a couple of years ago um, and work played a really important role in my chemotherapy and radiotherapy and treatment generally in that it gave me a distraction. It meant I wasn't defined by cancer, but it also meant I could work on my terms as much or as little as I could handle that day. I've also moved across the country seamlessly from London to Bristol in the Southwest of England. Um, and again, no issues with work. So work style helped me then. And now I have um, a caring situation in my close family that means that yet again, I've come to really personally value work style and put work style to the test and see that it can really work. So in many ways, I've seen work style in practice over the last eight years since we had that idea in the pub. And it's an idea that was a meeting of minds, really, because Lizzie, you were obviously trying to start a family and uh, juggle that uh, at a time you know, really that predated even cloud computing. But those technologies were, were coming out and we'll come on to that in a sec. But for me, uh, it was about how I would respond from going through burnout. So uh, most of the work that I'd done up to that point was um, exciting, uh, enjoyable work. I loved what I was doing, uh, running uh, the client servicing side of, of an agency that was doing really well, it was growing under its own steam uh, and as a result of our efforts. Um, but 
eventually I got to the point where I suddenly I didn't really I didn't really care about how well we were going. I, I felt it very difficult to feel emotional about the highs uh, or even the lows. And I think it was my wife at the time who said to me, you're a, a shadow of your former self right now. And what I later realised was that was um, that was burnout. That was at the point where psychologically my relationship with work had reached a, a really low point. And what I later came to realise is that that is primarily because I'd been judging my performance at work on the basis of how much time I put in, how many hours I was doing. Uh, contractually, we all uh, understand that people work nine to five Monday to Friday and you know, it's a 40 hour week. But I was validating my performance on whether I was doing a 60 hour week. Um, and if if I wasn't doing a 60 hour week, I wasn't doing enough. Um, and you know, eventually there's only so much that the body can give under those circumstances and eventually yeah I kind of reached a low point and uh the realization that took me to the conversation in the pub with Lizzie was that I didn't want to validate my work on how many hours I was doing anymore I wanted to be judged on my output in the same way as Lizzie did I wanted to be free to work when and where I chose and simply to achieve what we're setting out to achieve and be judged on that and that new psychological contract with work would require us to think differently about the way we work together. Uh, so what would happen if uh, if we had that, that ability to decide when and where we work? Well, the thing we decided was very early. We, there's no word for that. There's no word, no, no language around to help us communicate to one another when and where we work that isn't in some way related to nine to five. You know, it's typically we talk about you know, working part time or a flexible worker of some description that's all relative to the traditional nine to five uh, rigid system. So although we'd had a couple of dark and stormy cocktails that night, <laughs> we were able to <laughs> realise that the reason that this word didn't exist is because no one was doing this. Nobody was working this way yet. But there were certain factors, certain catalysts that were coming together at that time that meant that this was now possible where in the past it wasn't. So we decided, OK, let's create a word. Let's let's create this idea of work style and give everyone a language uh, to talk about when and where they work as individuals and how they fit their work around their life uh, rather than having their life have to fit around their work. And we came up with a hand gesture as well. We did. The W. The W of work style, which we've used many times <laughs> since then. And actually, you've enlarged on with some other hand gestures in the book. Yeah. Um, but what was really interesting was when we started using the word work style, we found people used it back to us in the same conversation. And so we realised that there was a real need for this word that wasn't loaded, like shirking from home or flax past or various <laughs> other ones. Um, and so since then, work style has become our mission. Um, and we went looking for uh, other organisations that existed that were working in this way, and we found none. And so we felt it was up to us to create one that could be a prototype and a, a grand experiment in working this way. And so eight years ago, Alex and I co-founded Hoxby, um, which is a community of freelancers around the world. And we work with some of the biggest clients in the world, AIA, Amazon, Merck, Unilever, um, delivering projects in creative communications and also in consulting to others in working in a work style way. We did. Uh, and the things that were happening at that time that we felt meant that this was the right time for Hoxby and the right time for work style was, as I alluded to earlier, firstly, technology was really changing quickly. We were moving into the cloud in the way that we collaborated, which suddenly meant we didn't need to be in the same buildings in order to work on projects together. We could work uh, in the cloud uh, and we didn't necessarily even have to be working at the same time. We could start working uh, asynchronously. I'll come on to that in a moment. And the other thing uh, that we realized at that point was actually a lot of people were starting to become freelance. Yeah, and there were there was a huge wave of people. The start of what was the the gig economy and remains so today it was the fastest growing labour force in the EU. Uh, or, 
albeit pre-pandemic, not sure what's happening with it right now. But the, the point is that freelancing was booming and continues to boom. And the idea of being freelance is becoming increasingly attractive to people who are looking for um, autonomy, control over their lives, but also to have multiple strings to the bone, to be people who are more than simply one job title in the work that they do and that they can get more fulfillment from that, um, which was captured very well through um, Emma Gannon's book, Portfolio Career, uh, sorry, multi hyper Method, uh, wherein she talked about portfolio careers. Um, so, and then lastly, ageing. Um, this ageing demographic that we have, we are an ageing population and the workforce is increasingly getting older and yet many of the the ways in which we work don't really accommodate that aging workforce particularly well. Uh, rigid working hours from a fixed location, for example, can be limiting to people who are who are older. Um, but aging we are, and we are set to be uh, an older population, aren't we? Twenty one percent of the worldwide population will be over sixty by twenty fifty so by the time we get there. Um, which is uh, which is staggering, but also exciting as an opportunity uh, to broaden the workforce and to learn from that aging expertise to generate to generate um, better work through intergenerational working. So three factors that were coming together at that time: aging, independence, and technology really combined to form the ideas of work style and the possibility for Hoxby to exist. And so we say that 2014 was a magical year um, because it was when all of those things came together and Hoxby was able to start. We were able to start an actual prototype of this way of working. So we started a community of freelancers um, because we felt that was the best way to pioneer the idea of work style back in 2015. Really, we felt that in order to be autonomous and choose when and where you worked, you had to be a freelancer because it was through freelancing that you had the actual autonomy rather than trying to please your employer. So that's why we're a freelance community and we still are today. And, and we felt that that was the closest proxy to autonomy. And we talk a lot about autonomous working. We're a decentralized autonomous organization for any HR organizational design geeks out there. Um, but also we talk about individualization of work. This is about making work personal to the individual. And again, that's what freelancing does. So what we do at Hoxby is we curate diverse, globally distributed teams to work in projects for companies who are looking to increase their impact by changing the way that, that they work um, and communicating the work that they do. And so, as I say, we do that with some of the biggest companies in the world, but we also do it with some impact, specific impact client with clients, which is very close to Alex and my heart. So B Labs, which is the business behind B Corporations, Divine Chocolate, Weight Watchers, ASICs, um, mm. and the list goes on. So for us, Hoxby is the prototype. It's where we test how this works. And let us tell you, we do not have it all sorted. You know, we've spent eight <laughs> years learning. Always improving is one of our values. And we are recognizing that this is an experimental way of working. And we're always trying to learn from the full community at Hoxby, how we can get better and how we can can manage um, to continue to pr produce exceptional work and make sure that we are respecting people's work styles and bringing those teams together in a really collaborative and exciting way. Mm. It's a completely different business model to um, how traditional work works. You know, we are, as you said, distributed autonomous, entirely freelance, officeless, um, and yet still able to collaborate and deliver fantastic projects for those reputable clients that we're, we're so proud to have. Um, but it is, as Izzy says, a test environment. So we've learned loads about how we do that and how we do it well, how we make work style work for everyone. Um, but we've also been doing our own research into it because obviously it's a it's a it's a test environment, but it's but it's a real world test environment where we can seek to understand better what the impact of work style is on work. And all of the research that we've done um, around autonomy, uh, as Lizzie talked about, and how autonomous work improves productivity gave us confidence that this was this was the case. Um, the, the, all of the existing research shows that um, 
productivity is increased uh, as a result of autonomy, work-life balance is better, job satisfaction is better, engagement is higher, stress is lower, staff turnover is lower, exhaustion is decreased. There's lots of great statistical evidence out there that supports autonomy being good for productivity. But what we wanted to prove through Hoxby, through our own research, um, was that that applies in the real world uh, when you give people complete autonomy. Uh, and what we discovered was that that was true, but also we discovered that it was true because of an increased state of well-being. So your autonomy in, makes you more productive because of an increased state of well-being, which we found to be particularly exciting. So through work style, we can create a, a work environment where everyone has autonomy, everyone has a higher state of well-being, therefore, and a more productive way of working for them as individuals and for us as, as collective organisations. Ah. I mean, <laughs> where will the future of work take us? That's where it'll take us, somewhere that we're all happier, we're all healthier, we're all choosing how we work, and we're all more productive. So this is why wow. we campaign for the work star revolution, because it just works for everyone and it's brilliant. Yeah. Um, so as I say, we, we learned a lot on our journey, and we have learned a lot, we're still learning a lot. Um, over the last eight years. And one of the things um, that we very early on did was was kind of recognise that there are certain conditions that you need for work style to work. You can't take just any organisation and any employee um, or and find that work style works. So there were three principles that we recognised early on that were necessary for work style to succeed. Um, and they are fundamental changes from the traditional working system of work to a work style system of work. Um, so the first is digital first, getting into the mindset of operating in a digital environment and, and doing that first. So embracing the likes of Slack. So as Alex said, at Hoxby, we don't have an office. Um, our office is Slack because then we can all go in there when it suits us. And that technology is really important to us. It underpins our whole business. But we also have a number of other technology and software systems that we use, like Google Suite, um, in order to collaborate really efficiently. So being digital first, not physical first, was a really important lesson for us. The second thing was that we need to be asynchronous, not synchronous. What we mean by that is we shouldn't need to work at the same time. It doesn't matter when you work. What matters is your brilliance and how you engage your mind. Back to me when I had a tiny baby, didn't matter if I worked at nap time and in the evenings, because that was when I felt really engaged with my work and did my best thinking. So asynchronous works on the assumption that everyone works when it suits them, but that we have the tools to underpin it to mean that it doesn't matter if we aren't working at the same time. So things like collaborating on Slack and Google Suite really facilitate that. And then the third thing is that it has to be a trust-based system. And that is really fundamental. You can have all the positive dreams of adopting a work style way of working that you like, but if you don't have a trust-based culture, and if it's not ingrained in your culture, then actually it's never going to succeed. And, and that requires organisations to not think about presenteeism and presence, but instead to focus on the outputs that people deliver and let them do it in their own ways. And we know that actually trust-based, high trust companies are more successful in lots of ways. Um, people who work at high trust companies report 74% less stress, for example, 106% more energy, 76% more engagement, and most importantly, 50% higher productivity. So actually, you are 50% more productive if you work at a high trust company. So those are the three things that we found were fundamental to underpinning work style in practice. So trust-based, asynchronous, and digital first. And these are things that we're seeing coming out of the, um, well, post-pandemic, we're seeing lots of talk about different ways of working and, you know, whether remote or hybrid or flexible um, are the future. Um, whatever you believe the future to be, uh, hopefully you believe it to be work style, um, but whatever you believe it to be, we, we think it's about um, enabling individuality and independence and those three things uh, apply uh, if we're to create the future of work that 
how everybody wants the, and that can be inclusive of everyone we'll come on to that in a minute but there is a big thing um, that comes with those three things as well so um a trust-based organization uh, particularly relies on individuals feeling a sense of accountability which as freelancers you would understand uh, well and are pioneering the way in terms of leading how you feel that sense of accountability balancing that accountability for the work with managing your own workflow is a skill that freelancers have been developing for years but it's something that is increasingly becoming uh, a, a required skill set for all workers uh, and hopefully you can see where this is going uh, but freelancers are really blazing a trail in in this important aspect of the future of work and accountability is is absolutely essential in enabling autonomy you might say you're an autonomous person and your autonomous hand might need to fit into an accountability glove they do indeed oh, look. go hand in glove I actually have, luckily, Alex, I have an accountability <laughs> glove right here. Look, I've got two accountability gloves. Perfect. There you go. There we are. There we are. Fingers My autonomous well. hands have fitted straight into those accountability gloves. So that's perfect. <laughs> um, and, and so for us, the outcome of this, and the thing that really excited Alex and I when we started on this work style journey all those years ago, um, is the inclusion and the changes to society that can come as a result of working this way. And these are really fundamental. So one of the things that we've looked at is, um, as we call them, excluded groups. And there's a whole section on this in the book, that the way we work now is a 200 year old system. And at the time, it was really revolutionary to only work eight hours a day, eight hours labour, eight hours recreation and eight hours rest. But 200 years on, we really should have evolved how we work. And by continuing to embrace that working structure or flexing around it, there are um, a number of groups, seven, that we've identified that are specifically excluded from work. And we talk about the gap stats um, that show just how many of those people are still excluded from work. So we're just going to take a minute to tell you those groups and those gap stats. So the first is, yeah. Because they should take it tests. Yeah, go on. All right. So <laughs> don't want to hear too much of me. The first <laughs> one is living with a disability. So 82% of people without disabilities work, but only 53% of those living with disabilities do. So that is a 29% gap. S similar, um, a similar gap to in mental health, where 43% um, of people with mental health problems are in employment compared to 74% of the general population. And that's a 31% gap. Carers are another group, an area close to my heart. 61% of carers don't do paid work, but 50% of those would like a job. So that's a 30.5% gap. Neurodiversity, 77% of people with autism want to work, but only 26% do, which is a 50 one percent gap it's huge um those living with illness uh chronic illness particularly 50 percent of people with long-term health conditions say that health is a barrier to the work they can do so that's a 50 percent gap that's people who want to be working but can't and for older workers only 39 percent of retiring workers do so voluntarily the majority would prefer to continue working in some capacity, which is a 61% gap. Madness. And we cannot function as an economy without starting to involve those older workers. And then finally, parenting. 86% of working parents want to work flexibly, but only 49% do. So there's a 37% gap there, even in a group that you would think was being best accommodated by flexible working. So... Yeah. We think it's really important that we start making significant strides to close these gaps, which flexible working has not done. And we think WorkStar is the answer to doing that. Yeah. And to, to make that to make it clear what we mean by that, we think the answer is enabling individual choice over when and where to work. So if everyone has that individual choice, then all of those people could access work if they could access it on their terms and we could close those gaps and if we were able to do that by 
revolutionising the way, the, the basic way in which we work. So forgetting nine to five office based principles and embracing the idea of work style, working when and where you choose as an individual and collaborating with one another in that way, then what we can get is a much more inclusive, a much more diverse workforce. And that manifests overall at a total level and within our organisation. Suddenly, we're able to create the levels of diversity that are so badly needed and so badly lacking across uh, the companies that and that we have and the way those companies are structured. So we begin to create diversity at, at, in, in real terms, both, both geographically, um, physically, ethnically, and also cognitively, which we know is really important to business performance. Having cognitively diverse groups of people increase the collective intelligence of the group. This is something that's being researched at the moment. And although it's early days, there is evidence to prove that it is cognitive diversity that enables groups to perform better than groups that lack cognitive diversity, groups of people who look, think and act the same and who agree with one another, otherwise known as groupthink, uh, which is kind of the other end of the negative end of that spectrum. So there's an opportunity here change the way that we work, include people that are being excluded by the traditional system, become more diverse, have a basic operating system that understands and appreciates individuality and individual contribution. And we can create collectively more intelligent companies and be a collectively more intelligent species as well overall. Perhaps the thing that's preventing us from solving some of our bigger challenges in the world is the fact that we're still working in a 200 year old system. Perhaps we need to just change the way we think about work at a total level and that could unlock a newfound level of human potential. Just small ambitions there then, Alex. <laughs> small <laughs> ambitions. And, you know, it should be said as we round up this, uh, this, this talk, the reason we're here and the reason that this is so important for you as freelancers is whether you realise it or not, you are blazing a trail for the future of work. The future of work is a place where autonomy is the norm, where people have the freedom to choose when and where they work. People have to learn that they need to be accountable for that autonomy. These are skills that as freelancers you're developing now, and that is preparing you for the future of work and enabling you to lead the rest of the world into that future of work. No pressure, <laughs> but you guys are the early adopters of work On style. <laughs> uh, and the way that you work and the way that freelancers and, and people collaborate is moving in this direction. So it's an exciting time to be a freelancer at the start of a new, uh, a new era of perhaps human collaboration uh, and human potential. So for us, this is about inclusion and not just the excluded groups we talked about, but also diversity in a more general sense that we see discrimination at work as well that in the individualization of work could overcome. So there are many, many reasons to believe this is the future, but it can only happen with us all working together. So um, if you want to support us, come and join us over in the Workstyle Revolution um, or pick up with us personally, and we'd love to chat. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you enjoy the rest of the programme. There are some fascinating speakers and conversations to follow. Uh, it's going to be a great, great event. And uh, we look forward to crossing paths with you all soon. See you soon. Bye-bye.